Hey guys, I made this little Office Mix presentation for you because I noticed a lot of you guys started to ask me questions when I brought in these 3D printed skulls into biology class. And a lot of you guys showed a lot of interest in terms of 3D printing, in terms of modeling, and in terms of evolution and kind of our ancestry. So this activity essentially is a chance for you to kind of combine all that stuff together. And at the end, what you get is a nice little 3D printed model of a skull that I will print out for you that you get to take kind of take home as a souvenir. It's not just a model printed out from a website though. I want you to learn a little bit more about 3D printing. So I want you to use freely available 3D printing software. And what we'll do is we'll place a hollow inside this model that will match the actual evolutionary cranial capacity of this animal. And what we'll also do is we'll put a little hole on the top or on the side so that we could fill this model essentially with sand and then empty it out and compare it to other models that people have made. So we have a whole class set of these different animals. So we're actually going to be signing up for different animals so that we all don't do the same one. And that kind of highlights one of the great things that 3D printing is amazing for. It's making these small kind of limited runs of really unique and exciting objects. It's not good for making like, you know, 10,000 of the same thing. It's for making one or two things that are totally unique that no one else in the world essentially has. And it's something that you have. And 3D printing and working with 3D models is really right now very, very exciting. It's very avant-garde. You have to think back to kind of how things were like with 2D 10 years ago. You probably won't remember what that was like, but 10 years ago, it was really hard to do even the simplest of things in 2D paint software. Now it's incredibly easy to put your head on like a Velociraptor body. It's second nature, like my eight-year-old could do it. And it's because we have these free kind of exciting to use tools now 3D is kind of becoming this kind of arena where we can use free tools and be really, really successful and do sophisticated and exciting things. All right, so here's the website I actually went to to grab those fossil models. It's AfricanFossils.org. And if you guys are watching this presentation on a phone, that's totally fine. But if you happen to be watching this on a PC, the nice thing is the links on the bottom are actually live. So you can click on that link on the bottom and you'll be taken essentially to the website. So everything that I essentially show you, you can have open in one window and then in your other windows, you can open up any programs that I ask you to. Okay, so go ahead and click on that website. All right, so as soon as you guys get to AfricanFossils.org, you should have a website that looks essentially like this. So what I suggest you do is you're gonna go down to where it says browse the fossil collection. You have that kind of magnifying glass like graphic. You're gonna hit it. Now we're only really interested in hominid fossils here, right? Because I want you to essentially do ones that are human. So you actually have a choice. If I look here, I have an awful lot of fairly complete skulls for me to choose from. And let's say if you're interested in a certain like age or epoch, I can dial this down to a different age, but I'll keep this all open so I can see all the different fossils that are offered. So let's say I'm really interested in, let's say this one, Kinmer 56, uh, sorry, 5306. I can click on this and then what it will essentially do is it'll give me a whole lot of information about this fossil, about where it was found. And then if I want to, I can hit this little 3D button and I can get a better, if I have a supported browser, it gives me an idea of what the fossil will actually look like once I actually go ahead and download it. And if you give it a little bit of time, it kind of comes into like a little bit of a better view. It downloads all the textures and there's my fossil there. So what I can do is, let's say I'm really, really interested in this fossil. I essentially want you to sign up for this fossil to make sure that no one has taken it. So to sign up for the fossil, what I want you guys to do is to uh, go inside of our Office 365 class site, go into the collaborative document section, and then you should be able to find this Excel file, which will be called Fossils Sign Up. Okay? I've already signed up and I've already printed out Kinmer 1813. So I don't want you guys to do that one again. I don't want to have kind of two of the same fossil. But you guys go on the Excel file, you'll be able to add your name and then add which fossil that is to your liking. Now, if you go and you look and if you see somebody else is doing your fossil, there are more than enough fossils essentially to go around. Go ahead, sign up for a different one. All right, now that we're back on this site and we're sure, and you're sure that no one else has really signed up for our fossil, you notice there's a download button here next to every single fossil. When I hit download, it actually asks me to sign up for this site. Now, typically I don't suggest people sign in Facebook or with Twitter or with a personal account, but this would be a great use of something like your Office 365 email account because it's actually an anonymous account that's not tied to your actual name. And you do essentially have to create like a, um, a membership to the site, which is free, before you download your model. 
Okay, so one, once you've uh, entered in your information there, you can hit download, then it gives you essentially two options. One, it says, is for a cardboard pattern, and the other one is a model for 3D printing, and that's the one that we obviously use. We're going to download a type of file that's called an STL file. So save it on a place on your computer where you'll, you'll easily be able to find it. All right, now that you've decided on your 3D model, what we have to now figure out is essentially what the cranial capacity of that animal was. Now, what we're going to do is use online sources. Now, I know it's really, really tempting to go into Wikipedia. I'd like to use somewhat of a more kind of official source. A great place to go is eFossils.org. Other places you could go is the website for the Smithsonian, actually. But I'll show you how to use eFossils.org. All right, so here we are on eFossils.org. Now, the best place to kind of go on this website is I want you to first go to Species, and then what I want you to do is select the actual species that you that you picked for your fossil. So let's say I picked here uh, Homo rudolfensis. What I'll end up seeing here is this page with all this interesting information about where the actual fossil was found. And now I go over here and I can click on View Specimens. And that will show you all the available fossils. And these are actually all links to even more information. So let's say you happen to have this skull, you know, Kinmer 1470. What you do is you'll see, and remember what we're looking for is the cranial capacity. That's the number one thing to pick up here. And the cranial capacity is usually reported in cc's, cubic centimeters. And that's basically equivalent to millimeter, uh, millimeters for, uh, milliliters excuse me, for us. Now also here, when it shows morphology and these links here to the, to the left here, these actually will show you and highlight parts of the skull that are important, right? And so what I want you to do is I want you to make note of at least two things, both kind of as, as where as the links come through and the information on the bottom that makes your kind of uh, skull a unique specimen, evolutionarily speaking, okay? So do think about two things, find two things and note the cranial capacity. Then we're gonna have to go ahead and take a look at Mesh Mixer. Alright, so the next piece of software I want you guys to get is Mesh Mixer. It's available at meshmixer.com slash download. You've got links there for both your Mac and your PC, and we're going to use this piece of software instead of using a web-based tool, because many web-based tools will actually crash when we're dealing with 3D models as large as the ones that we've just downloaded. Okay, so download and install the software for your platform. All right, so here we are, and we're inside of Mesh Mixer now, and it basically opens. And what we actually want to do is import the model that we took all that time to download and to choose. All right, so wherever you saved it on your computer, let's open it up, and then we'll be given our model. Now, your model may look a little bit different from mine. I picked uh, Kinmer 1813. I can move around here and change some of the shaders if I want to, just to kind of give it a different look. I kind of picked this silvery one. I just kind of like it, but. This is a 3D piece of software. Okay, it's it's for manipulating and uh, and working with 3D models. Most of you guys are going to be really really comfortable with using 2D image manipulation software, and 3D is obviously a little bit different. So just for some basic stuff like on how to navigate around the, the uh, your model, I can rotate around my model if I do a right click on my mouse or on my trackpad on any of the white space space like you know like the black space around my model. I can click and hold, and now I'm rotating my model. Okay, to zoom in and out, I can use a mouse wheel, or if I happen to have a trackpad on my computer, I can use, usually it's a two-finger swipe. And also, I can move around as well, and that, when moving around, actually, you're better off holding down the space bar, and you're kind of be, you'll be given this little kind of context menu here. This will help you, oh, sorry, this one here in the middle, sorry, will help you move around the scene. You actually shouldn't be moving around an awful lot. You should basically kind of try and keep it centered most you can, uh, kind of best you can, and then stabilize until you kind of have a good viewing angle. Now this model is actually ready to be printed right now, but if you remember, we're going to change things up a little bit with this model. We're going to put a cavity on the inside that matches the cranial capacity of the organism. So we can't just put in this circular like ball. In, on the inside of this animal's head, however, because it actually won't be the right size and most likely it won't actually fit. Now what we can do though is we can put kind of like a little mini skull, at least the back part of the skull here where the brain would be, on the inside. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to take this skull and we're actually going to kind of be slicing away all the face here because we don't need that. So however you have your model, I need you to essentially turn it so it's in this orientation here, kind of looking at it from the side. And we're going to do an operation that's called a plane cut. 
All right, so you notice all these controls here on the side. I'm going to go in here, ahead here and hit at the edit bar here. And you notice, I guess the fifth one down, and it depends on what version of Mexico Center you have, fifth one down is a plain cut. Now when I hit plain cut, what it's essentially going to do is it's going to make sure there's essentially kind of like this imaginary knife that's going to pass through this plane on the scene. And everything in one of the directions, and I can choose which direction, see how there's a fatter arrow here? I can choose this direction, and when this is all highlighted here, that means I'm going to be keeping that material and then discarding this material here, which is all hollow. But we don't want to do it that way. Remember, you want to keep kind of like this main skull region and get rid of essentially where you'd have the eye sockets in down here by the mouth. Now we can rotate the way this plane is essentially facing if I use this green bar here. So moving this green bar like so, I've essentially squared off and now I'm rotating around I can see that I'm going to be cutting off most of the eye sockets and the teeth and I'm going to be keeping a large amount of what appears to be a place where you'd think the brain would kind of be in the actual animal. Now I can move backward and forward too if I'm not quite happy. So you see this kind of bluish arrow, I can hit this and this is again going to be moving where my plane is and adjusting where my plane is. So let's say I'm happy with this. When I'm okay, I go here and I hit accept. And as you can see, I've made essentially this perfect slice through this skull. All right, what I now have to do is I have to essentially scale down this model here, like of the of the back, kind of like the, of the cranium of this animal, so that it matches the cranial capacity of the animal that we that we chose. Now, the only kind of tricky thing here is is that any other way, this would actually be kind of difficult to tell how big this thing is in real life. The nice thing about mesh mixer, you can actually calculate the volume for me. But because I'm working in CCs, I have to make sure that my units are in centimeters. And the units by default in mesh mixer, at least right now the version that I have, is actually in milliliters. Uh, sorry, in millimeters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this analysis tab over here. And you notice the second one down, it says units and dimensions. And you see here, it says dimensions, X, Y, and Z. Those are all my measurements in 3D space they are in fact in millimeters. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to change them here to centimeters and it says, hey, do you want to keep X, Y, or Z the same or do you want to, keep to convert them essentially to a new unit? And what we're going to be doing is going to be converting them to a new unit. Now once I've done this, I can go done and there's one other place I'm going to look. I'm going to go over here again to analysis. Then you notice here I have stability. Once I hit stability, and it seems kind of a funny place to look, I do in fact have a volume calculation for my object. So take a look there, it tells me the surface area, I don't really need to know that, but it also tells me the volume, and here it tells me that it's 510 cubic centimeters. Now let's say, just for the sake of argument, that this animal had a cranial capacity of 400. I have to make this smaller. And how I'm going to do that is by using a command called transform. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to instead here, notice how I have an edit button again. I'll go back to edit and I'm going to hit transform. Now all of a sudden I kind of get these different little controls in a sense around my model, around my object. All right. So this will allow us essentially to both move things. These are what these kind of arrows here do. This is just me moving my model in 3D space but also scale it. So let's say I wanted to scale it very, very far in one direction. So let's say I wanted to stretch it along this axis here. I could totally do that. Now be careful, it's really easy with software like this to kind of really get stuck and really deform your model until it's kind of nowhere near what you wanted it to be. So it's one of those things where undo comes in handy. Now remember what I wanted to do is I wanted to scale it down and we're going to scale them all down uniformly. What this essentially means is yeah there's a little white box in the middle there. That little white box I'm going to hold on to. I'm going to click and I'm going to drag and I'm going to scale it down. And you can see it getting smaller and smaller. If I scale it the other direction, sure it'll get bigger. But I know I want to make it smaller and smaller. Now this is actually a little bit of trial and error. So let's say I scale it down here and let's say I'm happy with that and I hit accept. I have to go back, remember analysis, stability, and then it will tell me what my new volume is. So just for the sake of this demo, I could go back and forth a couple of times until I exactly got the volume that I wanted, but let's say I am happy with this volume being roughly 
about 250 cubic centimeters. Now I need to put this and make it hollow and put it inside my original skull. So I'll show you how to do that now. Now what we're actually going to do is we're going to essentially delete this file off of our palette and then we're going to reopen or re-import our original file. So the reason, the way we can kind of get rid of this is we're going to go up here to view and then we're going to go show objects browser. This will show us essentially all the objects we currently have open inside the scene. So this is our Kinmer skull here. I'm going to go over here and hit the trash can. It's okay, we've already deleted it. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go and re-import that mesh mixer file that we downloaded. This is the original one that we just downloaded that we did not manipulate. And the reason why we kind of we have to reopen this, if you remember, this one comes with units essentially in millimeters. So we'll probably have to change it back to, to uh, centimeters. So if I go units dimension, and they are still in meter, uh, millimeters, I'll go change them to centimeters. Remember, I've got to convert it. So I hit convert. Now what I can do now is import what I just made. So again, I will hit the import button and I'm given this choice. It's append or it's replace. Now what I want to do is that basically with what append does, it makes it so that when I import something, it puts it almost beside my current model. Alright, so here I'll select that file in the location, uh, location where I saved it before and I'll go open here. And you know what's kind of funny is I'll do this and you'll think to yourself, hey look, I'm like looking around here and I can see there's two objects here on my object browser, but um, I only see one skull. Now, one of the funny things with this is that it's very sensitive as to where the location of one of the objects is. So, if you see how I actually have two objects here though on my object browser, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click one of them, your choice, I'm going to go back over here to edit, then I'm going to go transform. And let's see what happens when I go here, and let's say I pick this long purplish arrow. Oh, okay. I can see that I did in fact import it, but I happen to kind of import my one skull, the smaller one, right inside my my modern skull, like my my normal one. Now, so what I'm going to do is I'll hit accept there and then we can discuss kind of what to do next. So I do want these overlapping, but I kind of need to be able to look kind of, you know, inside these to see kind of what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my original one here, and I'll go over here and I'll hit Transform. And I'll move it back to a, kind of where I think that skull is. Now, but what I'm going to do is, notice how I have these magnet controls, or it kind of looks like a magnet? By hitting a magnet, I can make these kind of selectively visible. Okay? So in this case, I can go ahead and I can look around and I can see, did I in fact kind of put it exactly inside? Sometimes I'll get one kind of slightly off center and I have to reposition it. So if I'm happy kind of with where my skull is and I'm kind of 100% sure that, okay, it is right inside and there's no kind of weird intersection where the models are overlapping, I'll say fine. Now what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna tell Mixmixer to kind of get both of these files and to use one to cut out the inside of the other. All right, now just about every single piece of 3D modeling software as part of the process to actually create a 3D model and to kind of sculpt it uses what's known as Boolean processes or Boolean operations. So what we can do is we can actually tell Mishmexer to say one of these objects, in this case our bigger one, is the one that we want to keep and we want to have the smaller one cut out of it or cut out where the overlap is and how we do this is that we're going to go ahead and we're going to click on our main model this is our full one that we've downloaded a full size and I'm going to hold down my shift button and then I'm going to also click on the smaller one now you can't really see it here like in the actual imagery but both objects are selected as I can see inside my object browser now you see I have some new choices over here as well on the edit bar I've got boolean union, boolean difference, and boolean intersection the one that I actually want to use is Boolean difference. Now you're probably looking at this and saying, that's spectacular. There's like no change whatsoever. So I hit Boolean intersection just to make sure that we actually did something. What I'm going to actually do is another plain cut. So I'll hit plain cut and then I'll rotate it to see if we can kind of see a look on the inside. And you notice as we turn our plane, actually I'm really turning the plane cut a bit, a bit of an extreme way, sorry you can see that I do in fact have this completely hollowed out skull now with a giant kind of cavity right where we want it to be 
inside the brain. So I'm going to cancel out of this plain cut because now I'm actually pretty happy. So now, even though I don't realize it, see how there's only one object here in my object browser? It's this one, and it happens to have a cut essentially right where I want it. Alright, and remember one of the whole things that we actually want to do here is you want to be able to fill this model with sand and have it actually be the correct volume. Now that'll work, but we need a way of getting the sand into the model, don't we? So we can do this by making a hole right in the top. And the way that I like to do this is actually by using all the skills we've essentially learned so far. So I'm going to go here and instead of adding in another skull, Mesh Mixer comes with a bunch of like primitive shapes you can add in. In this case, I'm going to bring in a cylinder. So I click on my cylinder here, I'm going to drag it over, and as you can see, whoa, that's way too big. But I know that I can scale and I can move these objects, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm one -on -one. I know that I want to scale it a bit in this direction, kind of make it kind of pencil thin, and I'll scale it in this direction as well. So I'm fairly happy with that. I still think it's a bit too tall, so I'm going to scale it down like that. And I'm okay with a fairly kind of biggish cylinder because I want to be able to get some sand in here quite rapidly. All right, one of the easy mistakes to make is actually not to put your little cylinder kind of further enough into the house so that, so that it cuts all the way through the skull. So what we will do is I'll have it in this location and we're going to use those same boolean tools that we uh, used before. So I click first on my skull, the big one that I want to keep. I hold down shift and I'm going to select my other object. In this case it's called mesh like you know 14, but it is that cylinder there. Then again I'm going to go over here to boolean difference. So once I do this, I can actually see even from here that it made this really nice hole in this skull. And if I 3D printed this skull, I could easily fill this thing up with sand, and it, that volume of sh sand should actually match the cranial capacity of this animal. So over here I'll go accept, and then now I essentially want you to send this to me. So I'm gonna, you're gonna go here to accept, and we're gonna remember, export this final model now as an STL or stereolithography format file. I suggest the most efficient way of getting that file back to me is you put it up inside of your Office 365 OneDrive and the reason why we're putting it there is that it's a nice place to put really really big files since we essentially have unlimited space inside of our system. So you're going to upload this, you go over here to sharing, then please you type in essentially my name here to share it with me. Okay? Then once you do this, you let me know in class and then I can go ahead and print your model.